Hello, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to the webinar titled Challenges in Early Diagnosis for Childhood Cancers, Set Strategies That Work. So I'm Dr. Hello. Muhammad Safir Khan uh, from Pakistan, currently serving as a pediatric oncologist in Saudi Arabia. I'm uh, co-chair of SIOP Global Health Network uh, and uh, uh, just uh, completed my terms of three years as a SIOP uh, Chair of SIOP Education and Training Committee, uh, along with uh, uh, my fellow co-moderators, Dr. Nita Radhakrishnan is from India, and she is uh, uh, Chair of uh, International Pediatric Association uh, uh, membership, work, membership Area Working Group for Childhood Cancers, and she's also um, Co-Chair of SIOP Global Health Network Partnership Working Group, and a part of SIOP Global Health Network course chairing group, and along with Dr. Alan Davidson, Professor Dr. Alan Davidson is from South Africa. Uh, he's a pediatric oncologist at Red Cross Hospital, Cape Town, and he's also he's a trader of SIOP and the former co-chair chair of the SIOP Advocacy Committee. Uh, so we warmly welcome you to this uh, SIOP and IPA co-branded webinar. Uh, during this London Global Cancer Week. Can we move next? So uh, this session is, as I said, this is a SIOP and IPA collaborated session. Uh, we have a very busy agenda with a lot of uh, uh, speakers around the globe talking about early diagnosis, their experiences. We will start with the, the opening opening messages, a message from uh, IPA Vision for Childhood Cancer from Professor Aman Pulgam, Pulangam. Then we have uh, the talks on ongoing strategies and their impact, uh, and a bit about SIOP CEDAR project. And in the end, we have interactive panel discussion on global strategies for a, a diagnosis, possible way forward. Uh, the speakers, you can see all renowned faces, Professor Aman Pulangan from uh, Indonesia, then Dr. Lilia, Liliana Vasquez from Peru, Dr. Karina Coenetero from Panama, Dr. Rashmi Dalvi from India, Dr. Hikari Ambara from Indonesia, Dr. Lona Riner from Ghana, uh, Ilian Ketani from Tanzania, and myself. And then we have panelists, including Dr. Professor Kathy Pritchard Jones, Dr. Alan Davidson, and most importantly, we have Dr. Roberta Ortiz from WHO. Can we move next? And uh, just a few housekeeping instructions. Next slide. Uh, so uh, for the participants, uh, uh, you can click on the question at any time, the question uh, tab, and you can write uh, the text messages uh, for any questions or queries. Uh, we don't have voice option for audience uh, um, and just to make uh, this uh, a smooth session. Uh, the text answers will be uh, will come to the speakers and panelists, and we would respond uh, through the text answer, or we can keep some of the questions for the dedicated question and answers time after the panel discussion. We're going to open a very exciting session. I would uh, uh, invite uh, my uh, fellow co-moderator, of Dr. Alan Davidson, to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sagir. Uh, in, indeed, uh, Saab is very proud to be putting together this now third London Global Cancer Week Symposium, uh, co-sponsored by the International Pediatric Association. So growing an important relationship for us. And in that particular spirit, we're very proud to um, introduce Professor Aman Pulangan. He's a pediatric endocrinologist in the Faculty of Medicine in, at the University of Indonesia. And uh, he, he holds a number of important responsibilities. One of them is as member of the NCD Child Governing Council. He is the immediate past president of both the Asia Pacific Pediatric Association and the Indonesian Pediatric Society. And most importantly, this evening, 
Uh, he is uh, the executive director of the International Pediatric Association. So I'll hand over to him to set us on our way. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am Aman Pulungan, Executive Director of the International Pediatric Association. More than 1,000 children are diagnosed with cancer each day, while most high-income countries have successfully reached a survival rate of more than 80% for most types of childhood cancer. Children living with cancer in low middle income countries often face a different reality with diagnosis often very late and treatment that often unavailable or unaffordable. Only about 20 to 30% of those children survive. This inequity threatens our ability to realize that 2030 United Nations Agenda for SDG, especially goals 3.4, to reduce by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment. The International Pediatric Association is the largest international yeah. organization representing more than 1 million pediatricians from 164 member societies from 149 countries. As a global voice for change, we are committed to drive action needed to address the needs of children and adolescents to make child and adolescent health a top priority in achieving global goals. The theme for 2023-2025 is reaching every child. Among the 18 commitments made for global child health in the 30th IPA Congress in Gujarat, India, the International Pediatric Association commits to address the health care needs for children living with non-communicable diseases, including cancer, through early diagnosis and referral as needed for appropriate care and treatment. Equally as important is to prioritize support and commitments for the mental health and well-being of our children, as well as promoting access to essential medicine for children. At a time where the world is facing with multiple challenges as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the various humanitarian crises occurring globally, pediatricians globally must be forced for change to ensure that all our children, including those battling for chronic illnesses like cancer, are placed as an international, national, and local priority. Access to essential medicine and medical supplies must be guaranteed in all cases. We thank the International Society of Pediatric Oncology, one of the IPA member societies, for continuously being a global leader in advocating for children and adolescents living with childhood cancer globally. The International Pediatric Association will continue to do our part through our program area, working groups, as well as various collaboration with our partner globally to support the goal of the WHO Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer to achieve at least 60% survival and to reduce suffering for all children with cancer by 2030. On behalf of the International Pediatric Association, we thank SIOP Dr. Guilermo Chantada as the president of SIOP and Dr. Sagir Khan as well as the rest of the team for the collaboration. We wish the greatest success for the commencement of the London Global Cancer Week. May this even be a catalyst for change for every child, every age, everywhere, currently living with cancer globally. Thank you, Dr. Pulingan, for that message from International Pediatric Association. The goal or 
of international, the, the motto of International Pediatric Association is to work for every child everywhere uh, with every disease possibly. So in this condition, we are uh, talking about childhood cancer and it's a great forum to be associated with uh, where um, national pediatric societies, more than 160 national pediatric societies are part of this organization. And it's a great um, forum where uh, the efforts of all of us, of, of PSYOP as all, and all individual uh, uh, societies which work for cancer can be amplified. Now we go on to the next session. The next part of this uh, webinar discusses ongoing strategies that have uh, had an impact on early diagnosis for childhood cancer. So we have six speakers in this session, and it's my pleasure to introduce Liliana Vasquez, pediatric oncologist from Peru. She has done her master's in global child health and medical research. She has served as the past president of the Latin American Society of Pediatric Oncology, SLAUP, which is a continental branch of SIOP, and she is an international consultant for the Childhood Cancer Initiative, PAHO. Over to you, Liliana. Thank you very much, Nita, and thank you so much for the invitation to share with you some of the work that uh, it's been done in Peru and also in Latin America in this wonderful panel. Um, first of all, I would like to share with you one interesting experience that we had in, in Peru, in our country, as a case example of how we can change the numbers and to make an impact in this topic. And, uh, early diagnosis of childhood cancer. If we go back and look 10 years ago, when we started to, to talk about this, this important problem, the late diagnosis for childhood cancer in 2012 and 2014, we started publishing some data from several hospitals in the country. And we revealed that almost 70% of the children and adolescents with cancer were diagnosed at advanced stage. And that the mean time to diagnosis was more than 100 days. And now we have the possibility to have more data from the hospital-based registry in, in, in Peru uh, that is contributed with <clears throat> almost 11 centers in the country and that we have now a mean time to diagnosis of almost a half of that, 67 days. And particularly um, considering that this is uh, a different reality from different, uh, different cities uh, comparing the capital to other regions. But interestingly to see that there has been a different uh, uh, has been an impact on what happened in between of those those uh, years um, regarding some strategic activities that I would like to share with you. Um, today, uh, since 2018 and 2024, with the development of several um, activities and plans and national policies and the childhood cancer law that also put in the center um, the early diagnosis for childhood cancer in Peru, the development of a national training plan for healthcare workers, primary care care workers that so far have been um, training more than 6,000 professionals in the country, uh, the possibility to perform community awareness through campaigns and educational materials for educators, for the community, but also for professionals, and also the development of a smartphone application named Oncopets that has basically two roles, one of giving information for the professionals and the community, and the other role that is also to be a link uh, a quick link between the primary care physicians and also the, the experts in pediatric oncology. So it is an interesting case example to see that going back and now seeing the numbers of this impact on Peru um, is feasible. It's something that could be achieved with a lot of effort and also highlighting the commitment of the Ministry of Health of Peru and the uh, involvement of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. And also, I would like to share briefly with you some of the work that it's been done in Latin America as a regional movement. Uh, we had the opportunity to launch a campaign 
uh, named Support Kids by Cancer, based on many of the of the of the resources that were already available to develop brochures and also posters and a nice song that you can find in our website, in the Cure All Americas website. It's also available and also in that um, QR code. But for us, also that inter interesting, there has been reached more my than thirty thousand. Uh, people to the website downloading the resources and most importantly uh, using these um, materials for their own countries and adapting them to their own settings. So for example in the left we see in Ecuador, in Brazil when it has been adopted in Portuguese, in Colombia where it has been also a new design with uh, more to the local context in, in Colombia, in particular a city uh, La Guajira, where we had uh, a very interesting um, uh, workshop there in El Salvador. And also a second resource that uh, we're really proud to see uh, growing, that is the virtual course of the early diagnosis of, child, of cancer in children and adolescents, that it's available in three languages now. And we have more than 100,000 participants and, and 73,000 um, uh, participants that now have been um, certified and also using this information for their own settings. Uh, some numbers that we have is that more than 95% of them um, are very, have a high satisfaction with the cures. And the, interestingly, the, the comparison of the knowledge have increased in at least 60 to 65% uh, regarding the content to childhood cancer too. So I invite you to 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 share this resource with your um, colleagues as well. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share this with you in this session. Thank you, Liliana. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, let me invite the next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Karina Quintero from Panama. She's talking about uh, yeah. early diagnosis campaigns in uh, Panama, pro uh, especially uh, focusing on uh, the, re uh, the referral pathways. Dr. Karina has a recorded presentation. Hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity and for the pleasure to present the early diagnosis challenge and strategies here in Panama. Like a first step in 2016, we reviewed the past national cancer plan. This plan was only on paper and is what not operational. For this reason, we do a National Cancer Plan Commission and a National Cancer Plan Pediatric Commission. We have a big challenge because in our country, the estimate percentage of patients with late diagnosis was 80 to 90%. We discussed the different factors like untrained primary healthcare providers and the different delays in the health system. In 2018, we do a national cancer plan with a separate chapter for pediatric component. In 2021, we execute the first objective for the plan that was an early diagnosis guide and start to train more than 1,000 of primary healthcare providers. We use the Cure All framework to push the four main objectives that were early diagnosis, universal coverage law, updated treatment guidelines, and of course, Shalzun's cancer registry. The impact of our work remains to be seen. However, we are beginning to see little but significant change. We start to see more diagnosis in early staging, and what is more important, fewer advanced stage. Now, we see 59% of patients in advanced stage. This is Isabella, our first patient 
with early Wilms tumor stage in the last 10 years, and this was only in 2022. We hope that more cases like this reach us to be able to guarantee better survival for our patients. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much, Karina. Um, and now it's my enormous pleasure to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Rashmi Dalvi from India. She is uh, the chair of the SIOPS Advocacy Committee and a former president of SIOP Asia. Uh, during the day, when she's not when she's um, not doing all this wonderful work. She is a professor and head of the Department of Pediatrics at the Bombay His Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences. So she's going to talk to us about her context. Thank you, Rashmi. Um, thank you, Alan, for your uh, kind introduction. And um, I'm uh, here today to give you a snapshot of the Indian experience uh, with tackling the challenges of uh, uh, delayed diagnosis that we all face. Um, can I have the next slide, Amelia? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it is estimated that about uh, 60 to 70,000 new cases of childhood cancer will be incident uh, every year in India. And as we know from modeling estimates that uh, nearly half are expected to go undiagnosed with uh, equally uh, dismal uh, next survival rates. Next, please, Anilia. Uh, this story started with a presentation uh, at the PODC, that's a Pediatric Oncology in Developing Countries meeting in uh, a SIOC conference where uh, data from my center showed that over two thirds uh, of solid tumors presented uh, with advanced stage and so did uh, ALL with a significant delay uh, in uh, diagnostic uh, time to diagnosis and high abandonment uh, rates. Next please. And this data, uh, when we analyzed it, showed that uh, one of the important causes for delayed diagnosis was poor awareness about uh, childhood cancers, its curability, uh, not only among the population at large, but also among healthcare providers. And this was the reason for advanced disease at presentation. And uh, this was compounded with uh, complications of treatment, refusal, abandonment, and uh, so on. Next, please. Uh, at the same time, it so happened that SIOP was uh, gearing up uh, uh, to develop its own uh, global agenda. And uh, the first thing uh, they did was to arrange a strategic meeting uh, uh, to... Uh, find out what the needs of uh, developing countries were. So um, at this meeting, India was invited to present and uh, my colleague, Dr. Bharat Agarwal, uh, presented the challenges that we faced in pediatric oncology based on the earlier presentation that I showed you. And uh, we were to make proposals for possible intervention. And uh, we, uh, we were then invited to uh, take up the project uh, with uh, funding from the WHO. SIOP actually uh, arranged for funding for us through WHO, Division of Ch uh, Child and Adolescent uh, Health. Next, please. And uh, the uh, objective of this uh, workshop, these workshops was uh, to sensitize pediatrician that childhood cancer is potentially curable, how to diagnose these uh, clinical clues to diagnose them early and understand how what is the importance of timely uh, proper referral. And also we wanted to enable them to participate in uh, shared care of these patients. Next, please. Uh, so we started off uh, developing these uh, teaching modules uh, with an intensive uh, workshop and a two-day module uh, with uh, slide sets and a manual was uh, developed. And this con uh, consists of didactic lectures, practical demonstrations, and so on. Five years into the project, we had a trainer's review meeting. Uh, and uh, we here we developed additional, in addition to the two-day module, we developed short CME formats and single lecture formats as well. Uh, 15 years, 12 years down the line, we had a second revision of our training manual. Next slide, Anilia, please. Uh, so these workshops were held in uh, different kinds of settings in regional cancer centers, in uh, centers of excellence, in medical college departments, in pediatric departments with uh, PC, PO, uh, PCUs, as well as uh, in uh, smaller towns to the Indian Academy of Pediatrics uh, or medical colleges. Uh, and so on. So wherever we got a chance, we uh, tried to use some uh, the module in some way or the other. Next, please. 
So as you can see, these workshops, uh, the, the map shows the two-day uh, full, uh, full length workshops, which were held all over the country. And uh, over nearly 3,000 participants were trained. And uh, over and above that, another 3,000 or so were trained through these uh, shorter CME uh, sessions. Next, please. Um, there was a very, uh, apart from the enthusiasm that uh, was generated and, uh, you know, everyone was, uh, had showed a willingness to work together, uh, there was very stringent uh, project monitoring and uh, this brought in a lot of discipline. So we had PSYOP observers at uh, some of the key meetings and uh, every workshop conducted had a, an observer from another zone who uh, monitored the conduct of the workshop as well as uh, we had to submit very detailed reports to the WHO. So all that kept us uh, really on our toes. And uh, we had some presentations and awards uh, also uh, for this project. Next, please. Um, so, uh, you know, evaluation is important, but sometimes difficult in this kind of a situation. And, uh, but uh, this was the early evaluation immediately after the workshops, and uh, there was a very significant improvement in the pre, uh, in the post test uh, scores compared to the pre test scores of the pa uh, participants. Feedback evaluation from the participants also showed an overall uh, over 90% positive response. Informal communication with the workshop coordinators uh, also suggested a uh, decrease in uh, delays to diagnosis, uh, lesser, relatively lesser advanced disease, better liaison with pediatricians, lower abandonment rates. And importantly, there was uh, uh, you know, a spin-off of local and regional advocacy you know, because of uh, uh, you know, publishing in newspapers and uh, local uh, governments and so on. Next, please. So uh, as uh, we speak, we are about to roll out a formal uh, follow-up evaluation survey, um, which is underway now for the participants uh, as to how uh, they have benefited uh, down the line from this training in their uh, participation in care of childhood cancer and from the workshop organizers with respect to what changes they find in the attitude of pediatricians and the impact on referral patterns, abandonment, morbidity, and overall outcomes. Next, please. Um, but what is most exciting and most important um, is uh, the spin-off effects of uh, this project that we uh, took up. And uh, what we did with this project was the first step to development of pediatric oncology in our country. And that was the, you know, one of the cure-all pillars of the WHO GICC, which is strengthening the referral pathways. But uh, with this, what followed was uh, uh, something which we had actually put up in our initial proposal uh, to the uh, SIO PODC, and that was uh, development of a uh, PHO training program for the academic interactions uh, and networks, resources and uh, capacity building followed. And then uh, we have our own clinical research uh, group, the INPOG, which just has a, had a session a few hours ago in the London Global Cancer Week. And uh, now we have a, a developing a multi-stakeholder alliance. Uh, Paripasu with that, you know, clinical medicine also has improved and uh, we have robust NGO support. A lot of children are able to take uh, treatment. We have stem cell transplant, not for everyone. And uh, we have uh, a, a colleague uh, developing indigenous car -T as well. Uh, next, please. So the, uh, this has been an excite, exciting journey. And what I would say is that uh, yeah, this model uh, will be useful for many other countries uh, to develop, uh, you know, using this uh, model and develop their own, as well as uh, this pathway that I showed you. Every country probably will go through this kind of a pathway and, uh, you know, they don't have to reinvent the uh, wheel, you know. We took uh, 35 years to get where we are from the time we started, but uh, given today's uh, resources, and collaborations, I think, uh, you know, uh, it can be a much uh, shorter journey. Uh, I'll just end here by acknowledging our uh, thanks to Professor Lee, uh, Hans Peter Wagner from the SIOP who, uh, you know, uh, stood by us, had faith in what we were doing, as well as the WHO and my colleagues, Bharat Agarwal, Purna Kurkure, late Dr. Marvaha, Dr. Sachdeva and Kapoor, and everybody else uh, who has been here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Delby. And I think one, now, one more spin-off effect of it is, is it has encouraged a lot of pediatricians to become take up pediatric oncology 
uh, as a career and me being one of those people who have done this course when I was doing my MD in pediatrics. Thank you for that wonderful talk. And uh, so now we go on to the next speaker for today, Dr. Hikari Ambara Shakti. He is from uh, Indonesia. He's going to, he works in the pediatric hematology oncology department at the Sipto Mangus Kusmo Hospital at Jakarta. And uh, he's going to speak to us on universal health care. Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to talk at this meeting. I am Hikari, representing Indonesian Pediatric Society and Pediatric Oncologist working at National Repro Hospital in Indonesia since 2006. First, let me introduce Indonesia. Indonesia is an archipelago spread across 38 uh, provinces. The population of children is about 90 million children and the estimated number of the pediatric cancer care as pediatric cancer patient in Indonesia is around 13,000 uh, cases per year. We have only 63 pediatric oncology consultant only in 18 out of 38 provinces. Indonesia began developing universal health coverage in 2014. Previously, health insurance existed in the form of private health insurance or only for government employees. This condition causes many cancer patients are unable to reach uh, health services due to lack of funds or treatment was interrupted. And a study in Indonesia prior to the existence of uh, universal health coverage reported that the rate of delay in diagnosis and treatment in pediatric cancer patients was very high at 70 days. Diagnostic delay was about two months and the treatment delay was in a range from one day to three months. Universal health coverage or BPJS in Indonesia was established as a national program in 2014. Although all diseases can be covered, including cancer, however, in reality, it cannot be fully implemented due to various limitations. And in general, it can be said that the existence of BPJS has increased the coverage of cancer services throughout the country. BPJS has so positive impact on pediatric cancer care in Indonesia. One study in Java Island uh, so that the existence of EPGS significantly increased the coverage of pediatric cancer services for both poor and wealthy families. In low-income families, service coverage increased from 40% to 85%. The treatment abandonment decreased significantly from 36% to 22%. And also the even free survival increased from 30% to from 14% to 22% in all population. But perhaps because uh, BPJS is still a new program, there are still rules that are complicated or impractical, and it, it needs to be uh, improved. Another problem is that many patients are still unable to reach the hospital because they need to pay for transportation and daily expenses at the repro uh, hospital. And also the another, another issue is that standard diagnostic and therapeutic uh, tests can only be covered by insurance at repro hospitals. This creates a new problem of long QE for diagnostic and therapeutic uh, yeah. measures in hospital. And uh, at the end, uh, this is a cause uh, delays in diagnosis and treatment for all patients. We conducted a simple survey and it was seen that the long period of patient caused long diagnostic and therapeutic delay up to one to six weeks, some even more than six weeks to be able to undergo imaging examination or surgery. Many efforts have been made to improve this limitation and the program itself continues to be improved by the government in addition to harmonizing the understanding of the disease by BPJS with clinical guidelines. And this is uh, where professional organizations uh, play an important role to make BPJS more effective in pediatric cancer services. We're also working to increase the distribution of pediatric oncology consultant in all provinces by, to, by 20, uh, by two, uh, next year, we will have uh, 26 out of 38 provinces that can serve pediatric cancer care. We also 
invite third parties such as NGOs to play a role in helping pediatric cancer uh, patients, such as to provide shelters and transportation. In conclusion, universal health coverage in Indonesia have give positive impact in increasing pediatric cancer care and outcome. Pediatric cancer service uh, need to be improved immediately, for example, the number of consultants and hospital to overcome the, di uh, the delayed diagnosis and treatment, and also financial assistance outside the BPJS is still needed. Uh, I would like to thank the Indonesian Pediatric Society uh, Task Force for universal health coverage and also for working group of hematology oncology in uh, IPS. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hikari. This is a really a wonderful uh, presentation and the great uh, achievements by this USC. Probably uh, we would have some questions about it in the panel discussion and question and answer session. So let me introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lorna Rinner. She's from Ghana. She's lecturer in the Department of Child Health, University of Ghana, the lead consultant in charge of pediatric oncology unit at Cordley Teaching Hospital, Accra, Ghana, and a member of National Childhood Cancer Steering Committee and former president of SIOP Africa. So Dr. Lorna has a, a pre-recorded uh, presentation. Uh, please uh, display it. I'm going to present the experiences from Ghana. Ghana has a population of over 30 million people, with 38% of these being children under 15 years of age. The country incidence of childhood cancer is unknown, but it's estimated that approximately 1,200 new cases of childhood cancer will be affected annually. However, the total number of cases reported as diagnosed in 2022 was only 440 from all the treatment centers combined. Challenges with awareness and early detection are of importance with regards to early diagnosis. To address this issue, posters and flip charts on early warning signs and symptoms have been developed with the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service, WHO, World Child Cancer, and other stakeholders. And the Ghana Health Service has been actively involved in distributing these posters to all health facilities. To improve community awareness, there have been ongoing media engagements and NGOs are involved in um, awareness creation sessions at schools, markets, and churches. It's important to um, educate health workers on early detection. And in that manner, Ghana has undertaken training of trainers in all the 16 regions of the country. And it is expected that these trainers will cascade down the information to the districts and community facilities for early recognition and onward referral. In tackling delayed referrals from community to district to the tertiary pediatric oncology units, training resources have been developed for lower level health facilities, including community levels, using the IMCI approach. The community health workers are quite accustomed to using the IMCI approach to diagnose and manage childhood diseases. And in this um, case, they assess classify and act on the early warning signs and symptoms and supportive care for children suspected of having cancer. The early diagnostic workup is improved now as the number of facilities with capacity to diagnose childhood cancers has increased from two in 2016 now to eight centers. The challenge of out-of-pocket payment still remains However, a milestone has been achieved wherein the National Health Insurance Scheme now covers four childhood cancers, and this was achieved with advocacy from the First Lady of Ghana. And there's also partnership with private diagnostic facilities 
whereby um, Lifeline for Childhood Cancer and World Child Cancer pay for these private facilities to undertake scans for children expeditiously. Other diagnostic investigations are also um, paid for by these um, NGOs. With regards to specific diagnosis for some challenging cancers, our pathologists collaborate with external experts. As I've presented, there are several challenges to early diagnosis in our countries, but a number of interventions have been put in place by um, the policymakers and stakeholders in Ghana to address these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorna. Always so impressive. Wonderful to hear you speak. So the next speaker is from Tanzania. Elian Kiteni is a clinical oncology nurse. She's a coordinator and educator at Moambili National Hospital and the Moambili University of Health Sciences in Dar es Salaam. Um, she's also a member of SARP's Nursing Steering Committee and a co-chair of the Sub-Saharan African Nursing Network which has the mission of developing a specialized pediatric oncology nursing curriculum. And in terms of tonight, on top of all of this, she's leading a pediatric oncology training project with a focus on early cancer awareness. So Elioneth, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, my name is Elioneth Kiteni an oncology nurse specialist working at Mundiri National Hospital, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I'm going to take you through nurse driving education campaign in Africa as a strategy that work in tackling challenges in early diagnosis for childhood cancer. Globally, it is estimated that about 400,000 of children and adolescents with age of 0 to 19 years are diagnosed with cancer annually, whereas 28% of these children and adolescents live in Africa. Low survival rate of children and adolescents diagnosed with cancer is mainly contributed by delay of diagnosis at family level and at the health facilities, particularly in primary and secondary health centers, scarcity of diagnostic facilities, poor referral system, as well as abandonment of treatment. Early diagnosis is relevant in all settings and it improves survival rate, reduces suffering and cost of treatment. 80% of healthcare providers in most African health setting are nurses. They play a, a very vital role in identifying early warning signs of childhood and adolescents with cancer. This is because they are the first healthcare providers that meet a child at first hand and are very close to the community. Among of the strategies that works effectively on detecting childhood cancer is capacity building to nurses working at primary and secondary health settings. There are many initiatives that has taken place in Africa on this strategy, but to mention few, I will talk about the initiatives that has taken place in Tanzania, Uganda, and Ghana. Whereas in Tanzania, more than 250 nurses in the Southern Highland Zone have been trained on early warning sign assessment, while in Uganda, more than 50 nurses in Western Uganda and four, more than 40 nurses in Northern Ghana have been trained on early warning sign assessment. Mentorship Network among nurses, African nurses, particularly those in sub-Saharan region, has found to be very effective. Whereas more than 73 nurses has been trained to be the trainers, where they have been leading awareness campaign to the community and empowering other nurses. And these 
73 nurses. They have been working together through the Sub-Saharan African Pediatric Oncology Nurses Network, which is affiliated with Syrup Africa and sponsored by World Child Cancer UK. Nurses have been leading community awareness campaign, which has provided positive remark on identifying children and adolescents with cancer. These are the nurses who have been trained to be trainers that have conducted the community awareness into the community. And as we can see from Tanzania, more than 100 community members have been reached out, while in northern Ghana, more than 200 community members has been reached out and be empowered on the early warning signs of childhood cancer. Nursing education driving campaign has shown a very positive impact to the nurses by empowering them in terms of clinical competences, leadership skills, as well as health promotion skills. Furthermore, more than 80 8 children has been identified and referred promptly by nurses. As a remark from Ghana, most of patients are referred from community members as a result of knowledge that they gain from awareness activities. In conclusion, nurses play vital roles in identifying children and adolescents with cancer. Empowering them through nursing education is the key strategy to meet the goal of increasing survival rate. Thank you for listening. Welcome for any questions. Thank you, Leonard, for that wonderful uh, uh, discussion. And it's really heartening to see how, uh, as in, we, we always associate nursing with uh, the supportive care and delivering treatment, psychosocial support, etc. But we just highlighted how nursing is important for early diagnosis as well. Now we go on to the next section of this uh, webinar. There will be an overview on a SIOP IP initiative for early diagnosis called the CEDA project. So CEDAR is Childhood Cancer Early Diagnosis and Appropriate Referral uh, Project. And this is um, a joint activity between SIOP Education and Training Committee and International Pediatric Association. And we'll hear about it from uh, Dr. Sagesh Khan. Over to you, Sagesh. Thank you so much, Nita, for the kind introduction of CEDAR. So as we all know, uh, SIOP uh, mission revised for 2021-25 is published in Pediatric Blood and Cancer, is focusing on improving the lives of children and adolescents with cancer through global collaboration, education, training, research, and advocacy. So the goal three is education and training. And education and training committee focuses on three aspects, and the early diagnosis has been on the top of the list. So SIOP CEDAR project, uh, basic theme was its survivor outcome, as we all know, for children with cancer are quite lower in low and middle income countries where 90% of the children with cancer reside. Diagnostic delay is a significant problem in LMICs, which leads to high rates of advanced disease at presentation. Estimatedly 50% of the children with cancer in LMICs, they have delayed diagnosis, under diagnosis, or no diagnosis owing to lack of early recognition of symptoms and signs uh, among healthcare providers, and then barrier to access prompt consultations and referral to higher level of care. So SIOP CEDAR project was launched in collaboration with uh, very strong collaboration with International Pediatric Association with the a, with a objective to improve knowledge and understanding of general healthcare providers, including pediatricians, family practitioners, community nurses, who are involved in the initial care of uh, pediatric patients suspected of having cancer. So we offered practical advice from oncology experts around the globe for better knowledge to identify children with the suspicion of cancer at earliest possible stage. The first phase of the CEDAR project, which is over, uh, included a series of seven monthly webinars 
focusing on six WI2 index cancers. And it was attended, it was global presentation, not only by faculty, but also the participants. So these are the, the sessions from September 2022 to March 2023. All these sessions were CME accredited. The salient feature was very interactive question and answer sections and simultaneous uh, Spanish translation to which uh, SIOP offered and the YouTube recording of these sessions is available. Uh, about the faculty, we had 59 uh, experts who actually participated as faculty in these seven webinars. And you can see it was a representation for LMICs and HICs. So we, the moderators were most of the, uh, most uh, moderators were from uh, SIOP education and training members and uh, also IEPA uh, nominated folks. And the speakers, we, we tried to uh, make the maximum speakers from LMICs considering the perspectives uh, related to LMIC. So 20 were from LMICs out of 24. And the panelists included from high income countries and low middle income countries both. So about the participation, uh, you can see the numbers rising from 250 till 430 in different webinars. And these were, as you can see, the enthusiasm by uh, the folks for uh, this call for this, uh, the webinars and it's very strongly received in that case. And from where these participants were, you can see they represented 123 countries and you can see the number of countries in each continent. So it was representation from all over the globe. And interestingly, you can see the representation from all the income settings, including high income and upper middle income country, countries, there was a strong participation. So you can see on the map, it's a red color shading represent the number of webinars attended from different countries and the black one who did not uh, represent in these settings, uh, see their webinars. Uh, about the preparations, we had rigorous, very extensive preparations at the level of SIOP education and training committee, which, which uh, uh, stayed like uh, several months before starting. And then we have very strong guidance and collaboration and contribution from international pediatric uh, associations, strategic alliance group on NCD. SIOP office did a lot for guidance and production of these webinars. We had practice sessions before each session, and very important was the involvement of young fellows from LMICs who presented the case scenarios in, uh, in the WHO index cancer sessions. So the promotion was through flyers, uh, agenda, brochures, and the blog posts, which were in English and Spanish. Thank you, Claudia Sempor, who did all the Spanish translation work. So uh, the SIOP members, SIOP affiliated societies, were contacted through SIOP and IPA social media channels. We involved IPSO, especially for Wilms tumors and nursing networks and the CCI were also involved in, in campaign of advertisement. About the participants, uh, it was based on the survey findings. We had the post event survey, the 73% of the participants, they got the information from either SIOP or the IPA promotions. 24% had uh, the, the voice from the friends and the colleagues and three other sources. And the most uh, participants were physicians as expected, uh, 91%. And interestingly, 44% were the pediatricians and the primary care providers, including surgeons. And the 47% were pediatric oncology. So it reached to pediatric oncology community equally well as, uh, as the pediatricians uh, received it. And the nurses, other healthcare providers, and the survivors also joined some sessions. About the participants' feedback, you can see about uh, asking about relevance of the sessions, informati information that provided, meeting the expectations, and the new perspectives. We reached above 90% for each session by the participants' uh, uh, responses uh, for these all areas. And about implementable to the practice, so you can see it's very much and somewhat. So you, it's more than 90% for each session, which was uh, which we received from the survey participants after the survey, after the, the sessions. So interested to attend next webinar. So it was literally 100%. Even if you see the Wilms tumor session in March was the last one, and the, the, the folks wanted to attend the next one. 7% of the people, they wanted to stay and more. So that was an interest and the enthusiasm.
folks uh, uh, at the global level. So we asked uh, the pretext answer about the suggested topics for the next session. So you can see we had solid tumors, hematologic malignancies, cancer uh, diagnosis, treatment guidance, and supportive care, palliative care. These were the most liked topics uh, which uh, the participants uh, asked us to have in the future sessions. The bone sarcomas, the hematologic malignancies, supportive care topics they asked for oncologic emergencies, febrile neutropenia, treatment-related toxicities, and the treatment guidance about the updated management, treatment protocols, resource-adapted treatment guidelines, and for the cancer diagnosis, as we do early diagnosis, community awareness, cancer screening, and genetic basis of cancer. These were the suggested topics by the, by the folks. So it's not over. So it's a fragrance as so cedar wood. So we continue to have uh, more views of the recorded uh, uh, videos over the SIOP uh, YouTube channels on all seven webinars. You can see, see the views uh, by date, uh, to date. And uh, it will go further along. We have to uh, publicize this further on IP and so SIOP social media channels about availability of these videos over the YouTube, which is which was right comprehensive one hour sessions with a lot of discussion and question and answers. So in addition to that, that was the IPA driven uh, video, a uh, short video drive, uh, which was on ICCD 2023. We featured three renowned uh, global leaders, uh, Dr. Gurmush and Dada as the SIO president, Keniza Miguela from St. Jude, ID expert, and uh, Dr. Rashmi Dalby. Uh, with the short video clip, clip messages about the, uh, the childhood cancers. And you can see within the no time, like one month time, uh, by five social media platforms of IPA, these videos uh, were viewed about 20%, 20,000 of the people. So in the next steps we are thinking about just to promote the, the YouTube videos, which are already existing so that we, the, the people can listen and get a lot of further guidance. And then we are seriously brainstorming about the second phase of CDER project in collaboration with IPA. It is still under process about uh, the further steps. Uh, last, I would like to acknowledge a lot of lots of people who were actually uh, behind the scene and guiding and uh, uh, contributing, especially SIOP leadership, Professor Peter Krathip Richard Jones, who, who was uh, actually very much supportive under her presidency of SIOP, Julia Chalinor, Dr. Gurmush and Dada, IPA leadership, Professor Anwar, Professor Aman, and Dr. Michelle Farmer, and then each and every one of SIOP Education and Training Committee who actually contributed at, uh, at every level in terms of uh, preparation, in terms of presentation, moderation, and everywhere. And then, of course, uh, SIOP and the IPA uh, admin office, particularly Suzanne, Anelia, and IPA uh, team, and uh, then faculty, of course, and the participants who, who had so much enthusiasm to listen to these sessions. Hopefully, it will go further on. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sagir, very much. Um, looking at the at the, the we're on the hour so far, and we want to get through a couple of big fish, um, and then have some time to discuss everybody. So, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the next section, which is a, a a brief input from a couple of panelists. One of them is me, but the less said, the better. The important people are Roberta Ortiz. Uh, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, uh, based at the World Health Organization in Geneva, and I'll introduce her in a moment. And secondly, Kathy Pritchard-Jones, who is the immediate past president of SIOP and carries our flag for WHO affairs. So we're going to give you three perspectives, a perspective from uh, WHO GRCC, the perspective from SIOP Global, and the perspective from SIOP's Advocacy Committee around these issues and then open up for some discussion. So first of all, Roberta. Um, so Roberta is a pediatric oncologist from Nicaragua. Before jo joining the WHO cancer team in 2020, she worked at the National Pediatric Oncology Center in Managua and contributed with the National Ministry of Health to develop a national palliative care uh, program for children. 
she then she worked for many years in a variety of collaborative collaborative regional networks and then as i said earlier she um went to represent us as our as our front person uh, in geneva on the world on the global initiative for childhood cancer so without any further ado roberta Thank you very much, Alan, for the kind introduction. And thank you to Sayab for organizing this relevant webinar and for providing me for the opportunity to share with you. So uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all the presenters on their uh, amazing presentations and for sharing uh, the important experience that they have achieved. I think that that we are all uh, aware that early diagnosis programs constitute a core component of comprehensive cancer control. And assessing and identifying those main barriers that are responsible for delayed diagnosis is fundamental for uh, national health systems to design and implement programs to improve access to early diagnosis. So we have learned from the presentations today that there are several barriers to early diagnosis, including social, cultural, geographic, and logistic and financial barriers. And that it's very important to assess these barriers to design specific strategies, country strategies, as we have seen from the different uh, country cases that we we'll share, but also how these country cases can be uh, linked to regional strategies, as it was uh, showed by uh, Liliana from the example of PAHO. So as we have learned from the different countries' uh, strategies, we have seen that in the past five years, the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer has served as a common platform for sharing best practices, knowledge exchange, and implementation research. We know that through these case studies that were highlighted today, we have seen how through the implementation of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer Cural Framework, uh, specifically some of the core projects that make up this framework as is the implementation of workforce training packages to optimize the capacities of the workforce to early detect children with initial symptoms of cancer, strengthening referral pathways, developing advocacy portfolios and awareness campaigns has been fundamental in these countries to improve access to early diagnosis and in time hopefully uh, promote state shifting that will result in uh, achieving our, our global target of increasing survival. We know very well that all those factors that are responsible for the dismal outcomes for children who live in low and middle income countries and are diagnosed with cancer can be reversible through health system interventions as we have seen. So I just want to encourage uh, all the participants and the professional societies and the civil society organizations, the patients and survivor groups to continue advocating, to continue forming these important coalitions to support governments in your countries, in your settings, to uh, start implementing the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, to join the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, because together we can achieve those stated targets through the prioritization of uh, childhood cancer international policies. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share here with you. Thank you, Roberta, for that important message of uh to join hands uh, and advocate, keep keep advocating whichever part of the world you are in. So now we would like to uh, invite Kathy Pritchard Jones, Professor of Pediatric Oncology at UCL Great Ormond Street, uh, Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, London. And Kathy has served as the immediate past president of SIOP, and she is uh, chair of the newly formed WHO Non-State and the Actor Engagement Committee. Over to you, Kathy, for your thoughts. Thank you, Nita. Yes, I think we've heard some really excellent examples of how to make progress. And I think the key things I would emphasize are um, the need for uh, ability to collect your own local data through, you know, cancer registration or hospital based cancer registries. It's so important to know where you're starting from, even if it's a very bad position, as we heard in Panama, you know, 80 percent of the children presenting late. But the power of that first patient that comes through the clinic with um, 
low stage and potentially curable disease is so uplifting, not only for the healthcare team, but for the, you know, the work with governments and so on. So I would really emphasize the need to work together between clinicians, cancer registries, policymakers, the support from the government Ministry of Health to enable good quality uh, cancer data collection, whether it's through the healthcare institutions or hopefully eventually through the whole population so that one can not only know where you're starting from, but also be able to use this information to do prospective clinical studies and really make progress. Um, and I think this is one area where um, SIOP has a, you know, a great range of multi-professional experts who can help. Um, the other key message I took away from listening is the, the need for persistence over many years. And these um, access programs raising awareness that need to reach thousands of healthcare professionals over a long period of time to really make an impact. And I think we've heard how that works in Ghana, in Peru, um, in India and elsewhere. Uh, and now I'd just like to hand back to you because I know the rest of the discussion is going to be very productive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, and Dr. Kathy Trisha Johnson. Definitely, uh, as I hope as an organization can uh, can contribute uh, uh, a lot. Um, you know these sort of collaborations. Um, let me let me ask uh, Dr. Alan Davidson to pitch in and uh, share ideas. Is a uh, immediate past chair of SIOP Advocacy Committee and involved in a lot of uh, relevant stuff. And this uh, session was actually uh, initiated by SIOP Advocacy Committee under his leadership. So, Alan. Thanks again. I'll be uh, equally as, as, as brief as, as my wonderful um, co-panelists. So, so it's, I'm pulling the strings together here. SIOP has been struggling with how we do advocacy over a uh, uh, several years because traditionally we've been a close-knit unit with Childhood Cancer International advancing quite narrowly the cause of childhood cancer, concerned understandably about metrics, about burden of disease, about a whole lot of societal factors. And I think increasingly we're recognizing that collaboration with other parts of the NCD community and that's both pediatrics, as we have here today, the International Pediatric Association being the foremost of those partners, and adult oncology has benefits both on an advocacy level and on a practical level. Now, people may find that a little bit disconcerting to some degree, but actually we, we believe that more and more. And so we are doing these kind of collaborations with people in various spaces to make them think again to make adult oncologists say, hang on, what about the kids? What can we do? And to work together with other pediatric partners to advance the broad cause of non-communicable disease in pediatrics. So some of the things we've been looking at are advancing the value proposition of pediatric NCDs in general, and of course, childhood cancer in particular. There's strong published data on that. Uh, from the guys at Sick Kids, for one thing. Engagement with universal health coverage, because, of course, we don't get over the line, as we've heard tonight, without those partnerships in universal health coverage. And even, for example, responding to one of our own members, engagements around tobacco, which overshadows more of pediatric oncology than one might, if you first think about it, have pause to, th to think. So... So all of those types of initiatives to a greater or lesser degree impact on the quality of care and survivorship and essentially advance early diagnosis. And so really that's what, what, what our mission has become is to move this needle on multiple fronts. I have to point out though that these partnerships, and I, I want to respond to Paul, one of my fellow citizens <laughs> who's, who's Austin, and we just have to help Karina with her microphone there. We, we um, just to respond to you and Paul about, about out of country partnerships and um, the pediatric communities are wash with them. We, we have them from North to South, from South to South, many wonderful collaborations, but 
and this is a very important closing message, they must be appropriate for context. In particular, they must develop both services and staff in the global south, in low and middle income countries. Partnerships which are asymmetric, partnerships which, which recapitulate colonial uh, tendencies are bad. And I would, I would point you all to the partnership document from SIAP Africa, which is in the latest SIAP bulletin, which is a very detailed exposition of how those partnerships would look. So that's all from SIAP Advocacy and I'm looking forward to still 19 minutes of wonderful chat. Uh, great points, uh, Ellen. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we can further discuss these uh, the points by three co-panelists, and also there are so many questions which were answered, and some of them we can we can take as a live answers. Uh, somebody asked about uh, the uh, the uh, the resources which Liliana and uh, um, Lorna mentioned. So how to get them? Uh, you know, uh, so I think there is an answer, but Liliana, you can elaborate further here. Sure. No, thank you so much for, for the question. I think I will be able to share also in the chat, in the general chat, uh, some of the links of the website that uh, has several resources, not only for healthcare workers, but also for the community in related to campaigns or other uh, materials that would be of interest. I just wanted also to comment that uh, it is uh, very interesting how we can all have the same message on how to get to impactful strategies. And pointing out something that Kathy was mentioning already that's uh, part of the data, that for us at least it was a very important starting, starting point how we can improve. But the first step was to recognize that there was a problem and to show this and not to be shame i mean not to have shame to 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 share some data that is not too good at this point uh and in the first point uh regarding uh, the late diagnosis or regarding abandonment of treatment for example and i think this is uh, the combination of the political will that is very important for improving and for making impactful interventions, the possibility to transform the national, a national policy into action, it's very important. And uh, there are many, many examples that have been beautiful presented here and how we can transform this based on political will, national policies on these impactful interventions, and also from the point of view of the leadership of champions in the country that make this step on showing what's happening and how we can improve it. I think it's 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 one of the key messages that I take from all the incredible experience that I'm hearing today. And finally, also the involvement of in different stakeholders, not to be afraid on sharing this with perhaps the social, uh, the civil society, civil society or the um, uh, parents' organizations, because it's something that perhaps it's kind of difficult in the beginning to share this data and to be how we can act if we do not have an established plan. But I think it's very important to consider always to bring to the table everyone in uh, the discussion from the beginning. So thank you. There's another question now on the same. Uh project Liliana and uh, Rashmi Dalvi about how, because these both the projects that you have shared are projects that in, involve teamwork over a very long period of time. So how do you manage to sustain uh, uh, the enthusiasm and how do you keep yourself, uh, as in how does the energy keep uh, continuing? So what's been your experience? Liliana or Rashmi Dalvi? Rashmi, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so we have actually um, sustained this uh, over like over 25 years now. And what I, I mean, looking back, what I think was that uh, 
uh, at that time, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm generated because we have the, had this whole SIOP platform from where we started this work. So uh, I, that generated a lot of uh, enthusiasm. And uh, uh, for the first time, we were willing to work together. And what I think is that initially, in those initial few years, you know, when you are developing the program, you need a good leader who can take people with him or her, you know. And uh, we we did have uh, good people uh, at the helm uh, in those days. And actually, while preparing for this London, uh, I mean, LG, LG uh, CW webinar, when I went through the files from the last uh, 20 years, I realized how much work uh, had gone into it behind the scenes. So you, you need a good leadership who can take people with you. And that starts off the, you know, the initial five to 10 years, you need that. And then I think it becomes self-sustaining uh, beyond a certain uh, point of time. And uh, for example, uh, I'm sure Nita, you will also realize that uh, the younger generation now who are finishing fellowships and getting into you know, clinical practice and all, they are equally enthusiastic to conduct these uh, workshops. So, um, and uh, we also have had the support of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, so uh, that also helped, uh, gave us a lot of support in uh, reaching out to more people. So I think it was a win-win situation uh, in various ways. Of course, uh, we have a long way to go before, you know, we can uh, get early diagnosis, you know, for all patients. But yes, um, Liliana, what do you think? No, totally agree. I think it's, it's a... It's a long-term <laughs> career, right? To 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 continue, continuing uh, adapting and improving the strategy the strategies for uh, early diagnosis. Uh, I was just thinking when you mentioned about the sustainability uh, that sometimes to start a small is better, right? And that's something that we also uh, uh, lived here in Peru and many other countries as well to start with a small project that could uh, relate to early diagnosis in this case in our case was with this smartphone app the Oncopets that started very small but then also expanded in in many other settings and now is part also of a plan that will be part that will be uh, developed by uh, the Ministry of Health and other authorities in the country. So I think you need to believe on what you're doing, on your project, and how impactful can it be. Start small and always pilot, uh, and and to test it in 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 your city. But of course, uh, when it comes to sustainability, it needs uh, the effort of many many actors, many stakeholders, and I always believe that. Uh, if sometimes it's not a part of the government uh, strategy or action, it could be also covered by many other interested uh, stakeholders, such as foundations or other associations that are part of this, the pediatric oncology uh, uh, community that is also a big part of this. So I think it would be very important to recognize that the role of the different uh, actors in this is key to try to involve everyone as early as we can <laughs> in the development of this strategy in order to be sustainable, but also um, to to fight this uh, together and, and to listen to uh, also to the authorities and to try to, to work together that it's not easy, but I think it's very important. I think one important point uh, Liliana made, and I think that is also very important. She said about uh, you have to keep uh, reinventing yourself. So that, that is another aspect that, uh, you know, as time goes, the uh, treatments change, the whole, uh, many things change in your hospitals, in patients, in uh, treatments. Uh, so you have to keep reinventing. So we have actually gone through uh, three or four, uh, you know, revisions of uh, our training module and even now after within you know six seven years of the last uh, revision people are talking about uh, wanting some more changes so yes uh, that was an important point you made uh, 
question. there is a question yeah. we need some more support from international communities to make listen to ministry of health and carry out the projects to be implement to to be implementation nationwide so maybe i can ask roberta or kathy to comment on it yes by krishna yeah kathy please go ahead your hand is raised yes i i was going to uh, <laughs> make another point actually if that's okay um and maybe roberta could take the second question you just asked the point i wanted to make is that um, it's so important to have the parents and the survivors and the patients on board from the very beginning. You know, we have designed uh, work together internationally to create something to, called the Toronto Staging Consensus Guidelines to allow people in any country, uh, I'm talking about the, the doctors uh, and the registrars, to, to document how advanced the tumour stage is at diagnosis. And I think you have to get the parents with you because you know that to start with the results might, might look quite bad but the success story is that you managed to collect the data and actually compare it to another country maybe in your own continent and this is a success story to just have the data and know where you're starting from and I think working hand in hand with the parents to know it will then be a step-by-step -step thing you start to see more patients coming forward at an early stage when they're curable uh, and uh, you'll start to see successes so that was the point I wanted to make really about the the importance of the healthcare data but involving parents and survivors at an early stage because it's also a story to tell them to how to understand the data that you're collecting and interpret it about the progress you're making sorry I'm in the dark when I am I'm a bit dark I'll hand over to Roberta about the to answer the question that was in the the chat I was uh, reading another question regarding uh, how to measure or track progress on this uh, early diagnosis program. So I wanted to address that first, but just to also comment on the, what Kathy just mentioned, as we have, have seen through the example of the implementation of GACC now in 75 countries, this uh, multi-sectorial coalitions have been fundamental. So uh, professional societies, as Kathy was mentioning, the survi young survivor networks, uh, patients and parents groups are fundamental uh, to, to bring together, you know, these leaders, identify these leaders that need to be uh, and knocking on the doors of the national authorities, but with WHO country offices, because that is kind of like the pathway that uh, countries that want to engage in GACC have followed. So very strong coalition of national stakeholders uh, with the support for, from WHO country offices to try to trigger the interest uh, uh, of the ministries of health and, uh, and um, becoming part of, active part of a, a GACC. So that is uh, a one a way to go. And regarding uh, the importance and how to track progress, uh, as I mentioned, once these early diagnosis programs are established, it's very important, as Kathy was mentioning, the measuring, the monitoring and evaluation of such programs, understanding, uh, uh, assessing the, the amount of health workforce that has been strained, what are the capacities of the health workforce in early diagnosis, what, uh, how is the referral system working and it's very important very important to have facility uh, uh, reporting uh, data available because that's the only way that we can trace how these uh, programs are performing so it's very important that although assessing what the barriers are establishing the early diagnostics programs monitoring and evaluating the performance of these programs is fundamental also for sustainability of the programs thank you Uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Hikari to, um, if uh, you have some uh, further comments or suggestions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Sajir. I think uh, about the, how, uh, the effort, how to raise awareness uh, uh, from Minister of Health. Uh, in our experience, we really need to show the magnitude uh, 
of the cancer problem. So we need to provide uh, good data yeah. and this is a need a uh, cancer registry. Uh, although we don't have a cancer registry, national cancer registry in Indonesia, but uh, some uh, data collecting from uh, major provinces in Indonesia is uh, quite enough to emerge the, to raise the uh, awareness from the Ministry of Health to uh, make the cancer uh, problem as the priority from the uh, for the national program. And I think uh, maybe the SIA or other organization uh, can help in developing cancer registry in uh, some countries uh, uh, like Indonesia or Bangladesh or Nepal. Uh, I think uh, that's my comment, Dr. Sagir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Karina or Dr. Lorna and Elian if you have some further comments or suggestions before we, uh, we just uh, uh, going towards the close of the end of the session? Uh, Elian, you, um, you want to uh, add some? Yeah, Lorna, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, this is Lorna. Just to say that it's very important to, I mean, try to involve your ministries of health and WHO. WHO is quite instrumental, the country offices as well, in helping with these um, early warning, you know, signs and symptoms activities. And also, um, if uh, the, what I mentioned about the IMCI training for early, uh, for the health workers, Maybe if you could go through your WHO country office, get in touch with my country office because we worked with WHO country office. Then we'll be able to share what we've prepared, all the, the practical training slides and everything with, um, with, with your WHO office and then with you. So through WHO to our country office and then we'll be able to share the training slides we've, pre we've prepared for the lower level workers. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Lorna. And any uh, comments uh, and or the message, uh, Elena, for the nurses um, in Africa and beyond Africa? Yeah, um, thank you for the very uh, interactive session. Uh, the only thing that maybe I'll just keep on insisting, not far from what Dr. Lorna has said, is uh, to make sure as long as we know that the nurses plays a big role uh, because they are, the very, they are at the very first hand to meet the children or to meet the community within the, the law facil health facilities. Um, it is very crucial to involve the hospital management as well in, the, in, uh, in adapting and, um, and, um, and in adapting all this training so that all the healthcare providers, particularly nurses can be trained, then they can help uh, to identify all these kids and be uh, referred accordingly. So it's important also to see, to learn how, because I've seen some of the questions people are saying like, how can we engage or how can we bring this to our country? It is important also to learn from your country, how does the health system work and you start from there. But uh, looking from the Africa perspective, it's very important to involve the hospital management for the sustainability of whatever that you're going to start and to build the capacity to the nurses, but also to involve the like uh like in our country we have managed to involve the nursing association they have a very driving force power that uh, unites all the nurses and so i believe that in a country or wherever you are if you manage also to engage these um, professional associations they can help or in one way or another to improve this um, uh, early warning sign or early detection of the childhood cancer thank you Thank you so much, Elena. So I would ask uh, Karina uh, if she has a brief comment before we go for concluding this session. Hi, thank you for, for giving me this uh, minute. Um, 
I am only going to, to say about our work here in Panama. Uh, we have many stakeholders like uh, the foundations uh, and other stakeholders like uh, PAHO or OPS or uh, Pan American Healthcare uh, Organizations. Uh, they, with us and with our Ministry of Health, uh, together works about this uh, different uh, opportunity for uh, the different challenges in early diagnosis uh, and the work is uh, with uh, together uh, um, yeah, I don't know if you uh, you know but in, in this moment uh, we are part of the, the JCC uh, strategies and this is very important for this work thank you Thank you so much, Karina. So we are uh, um, 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 coming to, towards the end. So I would uh, request uh, uh, Professor Cathy Pritchard Jones. Uh, Ellen, you have some suggestion before we go to the concluding remarks by Professor. No, I'm glad that I slipped in before Cathy. Mohammed, if I can just direct people to the Q&A, my very good friend Layla is there. Yeah, my sister's talking about uh, FAPOG, the French... Uh, African Pediatric Oncology Group is about to launch an early diagnosis MOOC. Now, for those of you who don't know what a MOOC is, a major online, like, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, gosh, I can't find the last word. Um, like course. So that for for guys who are on here, um, please. I presume it's going to be in French, Leila. But please encourage any of your francophone uh, uh, colleagues in Africa to attend that. Thanks, Leila. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Leila. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, Katie, please. Okay. Um, well, I just want to say really to thank all the speakers. I think it's been a really marvelous session, and I hope everyone has learned a lot and, and seen how much progress can be made. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from the European Network of Cancer Registries and International Association of Cancer Registry meeting, uh, which is why there's background noise. But there's a lot of uh, work here from Africa, from Asia, and it's really encouraging to see how much the children's work can benefit from what's going on in the adult world uh, of cancer data collection. And I think fundamentally then we must start using standard protocols and monitor our outcomes. And I think I'll hand back to Alan because the background noise is too much, but thanks again. I don't know about that. I think it's a very nice note to end. We have to, the only thing that 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 um I need to do, Mohammed, is to thank you on behalf of the community for putting this together. He he is the architect. He scripted it, ladies and gentlemen, down to the very last word. So, and he should have the last word. Good night to all of you. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you so much to all the participants, all the speakers and the panelists and those who joined. Thank you so much for being with us. And we would have the recording on the SIOP YouTube channel. So goodbye. Thank you.